Hey guys, welcome back to Contest Prep University. I'm Joe Klimczewski with Adam Atkinson. We're going to do an end of series feature. And I thought after three small series in a row on different applications of PED use, which is something that we have just never addressed in, in all the years and probably almost a thousand episodes now, including our features, Adam, you know, let's just slow down a little bit and talk through it because I, I, I'm going to guess, this is probably me projecting, but I'm going to guess our average viewer or listener, average, is somebody who doesn't take PEDs, but is interested. They'd like to know what they are. They've been curious. Uh, of course, there are some people who are in that game and they they have maybe even more you know knowledge or experience than we do. But I really do think there's a large segment of the population. And, and, and I'll give you a reason why. I just had somebody walk into my facility who's an old friend of mine, owns a construction company. We've worked together before. And he's like, hey, you know what? I have this guy who works for me, you know, probably late 30s or something. And he just, you know, got hooked up with some guys at the gym and he's been doing some steroids. And my gosh, man, he went from like, you know, this size to 236. And now his neck is this big and his veins are like this. And, you know, that my friend doesn't know anything about this world, but he's like, should I do I, you know, is that something I, you know, like, how do you do that? And are there benefits? What are the risks? And so that particular person, especially in our audience who competes and they see people who may be getting that little edge. And as, you know, especially as we talked about with our series on women, you know, just their delts are a little bit bigger and they get a little bit leaner, you know, where is that line? And so out of all of the steps we've taken in these series so far, Adam, I really want to pull out of you more of an entire sequential process. If, if you were to advise somebody, let's say your child, let's say your 20 year old daughter, your 16 year old son came up to you and said, dad, I want to do this. How would you advise them and, and, and to be safe? Uh, maybe not a 16 year old, but let's, 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 say, let's say a responsible adult. Um, but how would you advise them to be safe, to do this properly, how to monitor? Like we, we talked about all the reasons to take those steps, but we didn't really talk about taking them. So let, let's start from square one. You got a client, they're interested in this. How, how are you going to educate them to do this properly, Adam? Yeah. So first thing is you want to weigh pros and cons, have a pros and cons list, anything genetic history health-wise that, you know, steroids might exaggerate for the most part too. So, you know, if you have a family history of heart disease, it may be something that you want to consider not doing. Or if you have a liver disease in your family, you know, that could definitely be an increased risk. I actually had a girl planning to do a cycle and we did her blood work. And I said, there's no way you're ready to start right now. And I said, are you okay with that? And she said, that's why I came to you because I knew you wouldn't let me do it unless I was ready. And uh, she definitely has a, a lot of time that we need to pull the liver enzymes down before she even considers. And also, I would just like to make sure those elevations stay down by themselves without any supplements to make sure there's not any kind of underlying issue that maybe she should get checked out. But you really do also, if you can assume something can go wrong, assume that it maybe will, even if you know what you're doing, you might get gynecomastia, you might get some voice deepening and you have to really have a conversation with yourself. Are you willing to stop if the side effects occur? And are you willing to take breaks or um, stop and reevaluate your plan along the way? These things are not necessarily physically addicting, but I think they are mentally addicting. You know, anytime you can look a certain way, just like when people get Botox, they usually keep getting Botox because it makes them look better. So at the end of the day, I think a lot of people have a hard time stopping when the time comes to stop. Mm -hmm. So you have to consider that before you dive in and just, uh, you know, really, really try to set some long-term goals for yourself. Do you want to be married in 10 years? Do you want to try to have a family in 10? Now, I think that's something that gets confused a lot is fertility and drugs. 
And, and we have to remember, if you haven't tried to have kids before, like you just don't know if the possibility is really possible for you. But uh, very rarely do I ever see it interrupt, uh, you know, being able to have a family. I, I think that that gets thrown around too easily. There's so many people who haven't done drugs that, you know, have to have IVF to have children anyhow. But you really have to do a pros and cons. All those things assume that something bad can happen. And, uh, you know, what would your course of action be to fix that? And uh, would you be willing to stop if it's just not for you? You know, I, I'm just thrilled that you started here, Adam. And it, it's one of the things that I mentioned to my friend who just left my building. And that is, you know, what, what has kept me from ever doing that in my entire career Uh is simply the foresight of asking the question, what's next? And whether it's Dorian Yates or Jay Cutler or Ronnie Coleman or anybody else, we know that once that anabolic environment goes back to baseline, like those results go away. Um, a really weird anecdotal story along these lines, uh, Joe Rogan just interviewed Carrot Top. And if you remember, Carrot Top was just jacked. He was just this you know freakish, bodybuilding monster. And now he's back down to like 140 pounds. And Rogan mentioned that like, dude, what happened? And, you know, you can obviously see that this is what it's like to be in that enhanced state, you know, in, in years of training, maintaining that. And then as soon as you don't have that anabolic hormonal environment, you go down to your genetic homeostatic baseline. So as I mentioned to my friend about his employee, I said, yeah, you know, if that was really important to you being big and strong, obviously this is not a competitor type story, but you have to realize that as soon as you stop doing that, you know, you go back down, you lose all of that. And then any of those side effects that were potentially there, you know, that's what you're left with, but that's also different than TRT, which is blah, blah, blah. But I, I just, I want to, I want to emphasize again, you know, what you're saying you know, look at who you want to be a year later, five years later, 10 years later, and whatever you get ready to embark on, is it truly worth it? You know, for me, it just wasn't. It, you know, I was already a drug-free professional bodybuilder. I would lose that and almost have to start over. And then would that be worthwhile? And, you know, I just made the decision. I didn't want to go down that road. But I, I see a lot more people now, especially with current information, being able to make that decision based on those incremental steps. And like you said, it's, it can be a slippery slope, but if you're monitoring and so forth, it just truly depends on what your goals are right now for the sport, maybe for your own personal aesthetic, but just realize that when that road comes to an end, you know, all of those benefits also come to an end. So I'm really interested, Adam, how many people do you see? Let me start with the women. When you go to, let's say, Nationals, junior nationals, USA, that kind of thing. And you're looking at the bikini rounds and maybe per class A through, you know, F, I think you have 20 or 30 women at these big national shows. How many are truly drug free doing absolutely nothing? It, would you still say it's a majority or, you know, how does that line fall? I would say probably 25% are drug free. I think it's pretty small. However, out of that 75% they're on, probably many of them should not be, you know, uh, I'll say you should have a really good foundation, a couple of years of competing under your belt. Make sure that you enjoy the sport because if you do this, your first show, you're going to think you need Anavar and whatever else drug to get into that kind of shape. And I think me and Joe have proven time and time again that you can do this without drugs and still win IFBB pro cards. Those are the type of people that probably should be taking once they get to the pro league or they're just that genetically gifted that they're going to get there. And uh, I really do think that it's it's probably 75% or on. Yeah. And I think only 20% of those people probably need to even consider it, you know? Well, I, I, I asked about the women specifically because that's, that's kind of what I consider the low level starting with just, you know, 10 milligrams or something of Anavar and so forth. But Sean Clarita just posted something today 
And uh, it was the 10 year challenge going around on social media. And exactly <laughs> 10 years ago, I helped him win a WNBF drug free world title. And I helped him win his IABB pro card at nationals, NPC nationals. And he weighed 128 pounds. Well, now he's gained 50 pounds in 10 years and he's the under 212 Mr. Olympia. And when you look at his side-by-side -side comparison of his photos, obviously 50 pounds more muscle makes a difference in size, but his body shape is the same. His genetics are the same. So you take somebody who is already a drug-free world champion and you add the anabolics and now he's a Mr. Olympia. You can take somebody who's got poor genetics. I mean, I have very average genetics. I'm a mixed bag, strengths and weaknesses. You put 50 pounds on me, I'm not going to be Mr. Olympia. You know, I'm, I probably won't even become an IFBB pro because I just, you know, genetics are still the foundation. And I think that's another real hard uh, variable to look at when you start down. Because moralistically, philosophically, I'm not anti-PED, but I think we do have to have those safeguards. You know, you, you don't you don't want in the MLB, for example, the you know home run champion with an asterisk or something like that. Then in our sport, we know where the the, the lines are for drug free organizations and untested. So again, I'm I'm not on one side or the other saying this is horrible or this is right, this is wrong. But I, I am concerned about people's physical health safety. And just those long-term decisions, is this something that you're truly going to be okay with? And can you be responsible and take those steps one at a time? I think one thing that was interesting about Sean, too, is, you know, a lot of people, when he was a bantam, still said he was not natural. And there's just freaks out there, guys. And we can argue all day on the internet or make thousands of YouTubes on who we think is natural or not. But at the end of the day... There, there's so many people that are naturally talented in other areas, music, bodybuilding, you know, tennis. There's, it, It's just not that far-fetched to me that people, you know, are going to be bigger than other people. But when people were calling him not natural and then he, he did become unnatural, it was amazing how much that guy grew. And uh, I believe he worked with John Meadows uh, when he switched. And John was an excellent coach, if anyone ever followed him. So, yeah, Sean made some great, great transformations. Um, one thing I wanted to note on, too, is Doug Miller just rode like 190s for 12 yesterday. And these people, I just looked at him and I thought, how many people must tell him that how amazing he would be if he did get on something, but I can totally respect the fact that he didn't. The bad thing is a million people are just going to argue that he's not natural until the day he dies, you know, but I, I guarantee if he took something, he'd probably be Mr. Olympia, you know? Well, there, there are a handful of clients in my career that I have told them, and this is rare because I, I again, would never, try to encourage somebody to do something where I don't feel like they're responsible enough to make this decision or they have enough information to make this decision. But there are some people in, in my 25 years of coaching that were just like Sean, who were at that, like they were so freaking genetically gifted and the sport means everything to them. Like this is their life. They wanted this. And they were the ones I said, you know, not telling you to do this, but if you went to that side, if you actually started responsibly taking PEDs, you do, you would be in the top five in the Olympia in the next, you know, three to five years. There's just no question. And yeah, bringing up somebody like Doug Miller, one of those guys, obviously, you know, clearly that would happen. Um, but you know, it's, you know, his career's not over. He could still make that decision, but at the same time, because of his, his business pursuits and his family, he's decided, Hey, it's just, um, even if he was only 150 pound average build, you know, he, he, he may or may not make that decision, but I think this is something where we all have to start, but let's get into some of the technical aspects because um, not, not that I want this to become a tutorial on how to do PEDs, but let's just say you decided to go down that road. Like where would somebody even start? Because obviously as schedule one substances, they're just, you just can't go to CVS and get these things. So, uh, so, you know, how would you even tell somebody to make sure they're getting something that's, that's safe and is what it says it is? Yeah, 
you know, get with a coach that definitely, you know, studies that stuff. You know, I, I obviously look for sources for reputable companies for my clients. What you don't want is a coach that's selling it to you. You don't know if you're getting the bottom of the barrel because they're not taking you seriously as a client and they're selling you the bunk stuff versus the real stuff. Another thing I've seen happen with coaches is some of these girls get locked into contracts where they can't discuss what they're doing. So then when they come over to me, I got to guess off their blood work because they <laughs> they can't tell me why their liver enzymes are super elevated, but I already know. Uh, or the coach will hold it over their head. Well, you'll never be able to get drugs if you leave me because they're kind of they they kind of hold girls captive with this stuff and i really hate that so they're like if you switch you won't be able to find it and some girls really are that lack of like confidence to leave because they're afraid they're gonna get screwed over by somebody else but little do they know they're getting held captive by their coach and they're screwing them over by forcing them to stay by selling them drugs <laughs> You know, and I, I want to make it very clear because you you and I, in our language in these series discussing this, I, I've said over and over that I, you know, kind of kind of intentionally, but also just not being a strong interest, I just don't know about this stuff. Like, I, I, I have not done my homework to tell people, yeah, start with this, do this, do it in this way, here, here are the amounts, cycle this way. I know none of that. Clearly, you you have you have taken the time to experience yourself and and, and you know gain this knowledge, Adam. Um, what do you think is uh, you know a, a proper way for somebody to educate themselves? Because you know we all go to Google, WebMD, whatever. But but where can people find information to even begin to learn these things? Like how many milligrams of this is safe? That kind of thing. Just just for broad knowledge, where would you send people? Yeah, there's some great books out there. Uh, usually there's a new anabolics book like every three or four years that comes out and it describes the chemistry of the compound and you can really educate yourself thoroughly on there. Uh, that's definitely a great place to start. There are some, man, I tell you what, boards are kind of all over the place because there's a mix of people that don't know what they're doing and uh, you'll hear a lot of people saying the same info and I would kind of steer people from going to those boards because it, it you're going to get a whirlwind of information that's very counterproductive and also it could just be you know a, a complete nobody on there just saying things that they've heard versus it actually being good information. The other thing I'll say about most sports too, any supplier can go on there and say their stuff is real and they can pay 10 of their friends to say it's real and uh, vouch for it and it's not. So you really do have to do your research. And uh, I, I tell a lot of people, one of the safest ways to do this is try to go to an HRT clinic and try to get a prescription but you can really spend a lot of time finding this. And uh, some of them you have to do telemedicine. If you find a good one, they may not be in your state or you may have to fly in once to visit the physician and then you're good for mail scripts the rest of the time. And, and if you did that, Adam, if you were going to an anti-aging clinic of some sort, uh, and you already mentioned this in one of our previous podcasts that there are doctors who are okay with this. It's like, yes, this is, this is beyond HRT. This, I know you're doing this for, for performance reasons. Um, are they okay? Like, can you actually get a script and go to Walgreens for your Diana ball or your trend or something like that? Is that actually available like that? So some of them are, they'll usually have their own like compounding pharmacy available, but what you do have to be careful is sometimes they're not correct on the dosage. I've had this happen twice in a couple of weeks where girls have gone to other clinics. Uh, they weren't on my team, but they, they just found these clinics due to uh, whether it be their coach or friend reference. But uh, I had a girl who was prescribed 250 milligrams of test a week, which is insane. Cause as a guy, like a normal level might be about around like 150 a week. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so a female obviously wants to be lower than that. 
And then additionally, like a week later, I had a client of mine who I recommended go to a clinic and uh, she called me after the appointment and they put her on uh, 150 milligrams of test a week. So I had to call the physician and tell them it was a NP. And I was like, there's no way you're sick in my client with 150 milligrams of tests. It's just not going to happen. So um, she was in the waiting room and we were having that conversation and she budged all the way down to 20, which I still thought was too high. So it was just clear this person had no idea what they were doing. So you really do have to be careful. And that's what's hard about this. You just have to be cautious, even in the most professional, you know, I could put on a lab coat and pretend I know everything setting. And, you know, people are still getting screwed over having side effects that they shouldn't be having. But I do, you know, just to go to the next level, which is I'm pretty sure the vast majority of people would would not feel comfortable going to the, the expense and the time of going to a clinic. And it's almost just too easy to get it from somebody at the gym or a coach. And, and I, I, I liken it to other scheduled drugs that you just have to like, like whoever's gotten cannabis or psilocybin or LSD or anything else, like you know, you, you, you've got a guy or, you know, I, I, you know, I, I may or may not have, have ordered things like that from foreign pharmacies and and you're taking a legal risk. Um, But there, there, you know, from the dark web to things like that, like, like there's just that inherent risk. You truly don't know what you're getting and there has to be some trust. And so I have to imagine coaches being a chain in that link or a link in that chain um, you know, they're, you, you almost feel like, well, they're, they have other clients and they haven't died and they're truly getting the effects of the, the anabolics. And so I, I can trust this person, but even that person has to trust their supplier who has to trust their supplier. And who knows when a bad batch of something comes through. And, and that is just one of those inherent risks, you know, maybe it's low, but it's there. I've had companies we've tested before and then down the road, it, they get a bad batch and it's just really up to the coach to monitor that and, uh, you know, know what to expect when you're on cycle. And you mentioned something that uh, was interesting to me is, uh, you know, everyone does have a guy. I've had clients who want to try their friend's guy because they <laughs> see they're like, her results seem so much better than me. I've got a great story about this. I had a girl try someone else's guy and immediately she gained like eight pounds. And I was like, there's no way this is real bar. So I just got curious. I got on Instagram and I saw her friend. Her friend was huge, but she also had a crap ton of virilization. So I, I just said, you know, I, you don't want to use her guy anymore. And, you know, if you really look and like one of the girls had posted a reel and it was actually her real voice, it wasn't like a voiceover, but you almost would have assumed it was. <laughs> so I was like, you, you don't want to use her guy. Trust me. I said within the first week, I can already tell this isn't real. And then to another point, when you say it's everyone's real, good, you mean it was just something else, like something, it was something it else. Just, it wasn't real Anavar. It was yeah. definitely D ball, I think, right. or at right. least mixed with something that acted like D ball. Yeah. So, so whatever the, that guy, whatever that dealer can get, like you're just going to, they're going to sell whatever they can get money for. And you have to trust whether it's really the, the right stuff. Yeah. And D ball is super cheap. It would definitely work for a female, but at the same time, it's, it's going to virilize pretty bad. So you definitely don't want that. Also, you always had to keep in mind, you know, one thing that kept me from doing anything crazy was, uh, I mean, unless I was guaranteed going to look like Mike O'Hearn after I was done, I mean, there was no purpose in me doing anything like that. And you can ask Ronnie Coleman what his cycle is, Dennis Wolf, any of these guys. Chances are, if you do what they're doing, you're still not going to look like that. Right. <laughs> and that's, you know, everyone wants the magic cycle, the magic potion. But so often people don't realize on these higher ups, a lot of times these coaches are paying these athletes because they are that darn good. 
It is, you know, when you see these coaches that post the same athlete all the time, it looks like they don't even have anyone else. That's their, that's their bread and butter at the end of the day. They're paying them to be on their team. Yeah, and believe me, so if you funny. do what they're doing, you're not going to look like them. Yeah. So let's let's leave this aside for a second and assume you can get great stuff. It's safe. It's pure. You can trust the whole process. I don't I don't think I'm doing anything to implicate you where you don't want to be implicated. But you're obviously somebody who knows this now, like you and and clearly for a while. Uh, are, Are you comfortable? Like if a client says or even if I said, hey, Adam, here's here's what I think. I've got this client. Like, like, you know exactly how and why to do certain things and you feel like, like you can be safe and effective in, in guiding people through the process. I do as long as they're honest about health history, you know, but you know, you always, I always do things I'm comfortable sleeping on at the end of the night. And uh, that's, that's, what's really important to me. I, I do a lot of, I think additional stuff coaches don't do, um, I don't let my girls image their face if they're taking <laughs> every girl likes to do that for their morning progress shots, but I want to see their face. I want to make sure they're not viralizing. I have them download voice recorder apps so they can tell if their pitch is changing. And, you know, at the end of the day, I want to be proud of my work. That's the whole reason I do this. And if I ruin somebody, honestly, I'd probably just close my doors if I felt like it was my fault. I just couldn't live with that. Well, you know, as somebody who certifies and licenses and mentors coaches, and I have all kinds of organizations I do that through the National Academy of Metabolic Science, the Sport and Nutrition Association, Nutrition Coaching Global Mastermind, the Diet Doc is a parent company. Uh, you know, one of the things I say multiple times every day is the phrase scope of practice, scope of practice, scope of practice, even as a personal nutrition coach, not being a registered dietitian. And if you're not in a company like ours that has a medical director and, and you truly are, are legal, you know, you still have that ethical consideration to say, you know, even if it's just with nutrition, you know, here's what I would do and here's what, what you should expect and this, and what do you think about that? And, you know, if we made these changes, do you agree with that? Like I, I make it a, a very responsibility-based partnership where, where that client is the ultimate authority. And I'm, I'm in my home base as an educator in a guide. I am not even authoritative with a client to say, eat this, do this, change your macros to this. I, I have that discussion. I have to imagine with something like this, you, you also are saying, hey, this is, here's the research, here are articles, here's what we're going to be looking at, but this is your decision. Like I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not giving you this stuff out of my trunk and I'm not, um, you know, telling you what to do. You really have to make sure that that client is making the right decisions. Yeah, I agree audio message to a client. There was a lot I wanted to explain yesterday. She had ran a couple cycles and I wanted to talk to her about HGH because she's already taken what I think her higher, highest dose of an androgen should be and an androgen that's a, a little stronger than like bar or anything like that. And she handled it well, but she still wants more. She wants some muscle growth. And I discussed how HGH could be beneficial and she could stay feminine with that. But the end of that audio, I said, I also don't want you to think that this is a must. I'm just discussing all of your possibilities. And at the end of the day, it's definitely up to you if you would like to add this. And I said, I'm totally okay sticking with what we've been doing. But I said, I sense you're wanting more, wanting more size and wanting to do it quickly. And I said, this could be a good option if you're open to it. And, and isn't that maybe just kind of ending on a philosophical note, maybe a, a siren song warning in that, you know, here, here's what I've done so far and it's worked. I've, I've done this and now I want just a little bit more. And man, I, I got to nationals this year and, and almost won, got first call out. So maybe just a little bit more. And then maybe if we just add this, and then all of a sudden, you know, how far are we willing to go in pursuit of what? Like, what, what is the ultimate goal? What, what would that, that perfect win and career look like? And are those changes in your physique what you're really willing to pay? Is, is it something mm-hmm. that desirable? And, and I think that has to be 
a, a, a conversation we have with ourselves every single step of the way before we, we take that next step. Yeah, absolutely. And you want to reevaluate it at times too, and just come back to it and, and just kind of see, you know, is this still the direction I want to go? And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I lost one of my best clients because she wanted to pursue bodybuilding. She did not have a bodybuilding physique. And, and I said, I don't know if I can sleep at night to do to you what it's going to take to do that. And I said, maybe you surprised me, but I said, I just, I really, I really think it's going to look bad on me if I do it because everyone's going to associate that much of a change with what I do. And I, I always say I don't turn pugs into giraffes. And that was exactly what that scenario would have been. And that's what it's starting to look like online. And I'm just glad I'm not a part of it. Well, I think this is great that we had these conversations because when I've seen these in the past, you know, first of all, it's either just a how to tutorial, like take this, take this, take this, do this, or it's just kind of, you know, one way or the other, but just to have an open conversation about, you know, here's what it is. This is what the sport is like. Here are the steps. Here's how you can be responsible. So I I'm, I'm really in debt to you on this one, Adam, for you, for your expertise and, and the amount of time you put into learning this stuff. So um, and, and you guys who are watching and listening, if you have specific questions about these things, I know it is a touchy topic, but feel free to message us. We're going to move on now to other series as we get into the new year, but uh, appreciate you hanging in there for three series and now an, an end of series feature. And we'll see you guys next time in Contest Prep University.